Good afternoon po sa lahat at welcome to Era of Ecumenism. Uh, this is actually our event organized by the National Council of Churches in the Philippines in celebration of the 500 year of Christianity in the Philippines. Actually, sa last year pa po ito, this is actually a continuation of that celebration. And as we mark this year's week of prayer for Christian unity, so I am Klein Pausto Emperado, a youth leader from the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, and is presently employed as staff of the Silliman University Divinity School. So welcome po sa lahat sa ating mga uh, participants ito sa loob ng Zoom at sa mga uh, viewers naman sa ating Facebook Live. So we know that uh, we all have stories to tell about ecumenism. Uh, personal, may it be uh, family, family narrative or community narrative and uh, the era of ecumenism. Ito pong uh, panahon ng pakikipagkaisa ay hindi lang nangyari uh, just uh, just with a glimpse of, parang uh, with a blink of an eye, uh, there were contributing factors that led to this era of ecumenism. And this afternoon, we will explore from uh, the stories of NCCP, PCEC, and of course, from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, this era of ecumenism. So to begin with our uh, event this afternoon, let us be one in spirit and in mind and with our whole beings as we begin this uh, event, online event with a very special song, of course, from the Divinity School. <laughs> Nagkiusa na o by current Cosmopolitan uh, Church uh, Choir Director Dominga Ga Tabada. Now, let us have the greetings and rationale by the Program Secretary on Christian Unity and Ecumenical Relations of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, Reverend Irma Mipiko Balaba.
Now let us welcome again Reverend Irma Mitiko Balaba, Program Secretary of the Christian Unity and Ecumenical Relations of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines for the greetings and rationale. Malinig, marinig po. Yes po. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry for some technical problems. Uh, Magina yung ating uh, signal. Uh, greetings from the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, our dear ecumenical uh, partners and uh, friends who are here with us this afternoon and who join with us since our since our so this this conceptualize an order committee means as part observance uh, and the years of Christianization station all throughout the Philippine history and in general and the history of Christianity in the Philippines in particular, colonizers such as which we have discussed in our previous uh, uh, discussions in our first, second, and third forum, American and Japanese have creatively used and influenced the church and their leadership to support its economic and political military aim to the disadvantage of the Filipino people. And this has created a neo-colonial structure in our country. But in the course of Philippine history, we should not forget that there are Christians known and unknown. And even the neo neo then and now through the inspiration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaiming and living out the gospel that frees and brings justice and genuine peace. Now, as we commemorate the 500 years of Christianity that forms the divergent perspective of the different Christian groups and denominations in the Philippines, the basic question that we should answer is what is the impact of Christianity in the Philippines? Again, what is the impact of Christianity in the Philippines? Informing, if not transforming, the Philippine economic, political, and cultural landscape towards the building of a just and humane Hello? Marinig po? Sige po. Okay. Marinig po, Chapilang. So, Opo, uh, may mahina talaga. This series of webinar, this will be our fifth, will help us to, and have helped us to navigate the history of Philippine Christianity. And we are guided by some objectives. First, to identify the turning points in the spread of Christianity in the Philippines. Second, to critic the mission theories and strategies employed in the Philippines. And third, to demonstrate the new ways of mission in the Philippines today. We hope our dear church, ecumenical partners and friends to reminisce the past but more so to learn the lessons of our history to correct our errors of Christianity that creating visions and have lasting impact to Filipino people, hindering our resolve as a nation to create a just and peaceful society. So we 
we are hoping and praying for a more fruitful uh, discussion this afternoon and may this will lead us to work together in ushering God's reign of just and lasting peace. Good afternoon. Maraming salamat, uh, Reverend Irma, for that uh, rationale and greetings on behalf of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. Uh, yun po, uh, to start the ball rolling, tayo po ay uh, introduce na natin yung first speaker. So we will start this uh, very meaningful sharing of uh, information and narrative for this afternoon. Her story, his story, so for us to be very gender sensitive. Uh, our first speaker is the Right Reverend Joel O. Porlares. Uh, he completed his theological studies from the St. Andrews Theological Seminary in 1984. On that same year, he was ordained into priesthood. In 2013, he was consecrated into the Sacred Order of Episcopacy and served as diocesan bishop of the Diocese of Bataan and Bulacan, or we call it local church of Bataan and Bulacan, from 2013 to 2017. In the General Assembly of May 2017, he was, elect, he was elected as General Secretary of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente. And in November of 2019, during the National Council of Churches in the Philippines General Assembly, of course, he was elected Vice Chair of NCCP. Years back, Bishop Joel also taught church law and history at the Aglipay Central Theological Seminary and St. Andrew's Theological Seminary. Let us welcome Bishop Joel Porlares. Mga kapatid, magandang uh, uh, apon po sa inyong lahat. <coughs> uh, I have uh, uh, entitled my presentation in CCP and Ecumenical Challenge. Uh, siguro eh, Itong picture na ito ay will cap everything about ecumenical, ecumenical uh, uh, movement sa loob ng mga <coughs> ng mga simbahan dito sa loob ng iglesia uh, ng na iglesia dito sa buong Pilipinas. Uh, pero ang buhay at uh, <coughs> nakaraan ng NCCP <coughs> ay napakatagal na na nakikita natin pero hindi pangalan in CCP ang nakabandera mga kapatid. Uh, bago dumating man ang uh, ang gera sa ika second uh, second world war ay may pangangailangan na ang mga kapatid noong una na mag-envision ng isang uh, kapulungan na kung saan ay uh, uh, pagkakasama-sama ang mga simbahan at pagkakakilala at ganoon ay mayroong mga programa na sila ay gagawin. Uh, hindi ko na pahabain yung mga pangalan na lamang ang babanggitin ko bago ang Second World War ay binuo nila yung Philippine Federation of Evangelical Churches. Uh, ito ay isa sa inabot ito ng gera ng Hapon at ang Amerikano dito sa Pilipinas, dahil lang sa'yo naman ang contending forces noong panahon na yan, ay uh, <clears throat> there was an attempt by the Japanese uh, imperial uh, forces to use this ecumenical movement para <clears throat> ang lahat ng mga simbahan sa buong Pilipinas ay pagkaisahin sa pandela nila. Yan po yung nangyari. At ito ay nagkaroon ng, at nagdulot ito ng pagkakahiwahiwalay ng mga simbahan. Dahil lang sa marami ang mga simbahan noon, lalo tigit ang mga uh, nasa doob ng Protestantism at saka ng evangelical, uh, mainline evangelical churches ay naka-align sa mga Amerikano. At marami din doon, doon sa loob ng mga simbahan na ito na mga kapatiran ay kumampirin sa mga Hapon. So, divided ang buong simbahan ang mga simbahan nung panahon na yan. Kaya 
nag-short live yung sinasabing gustong pagkakaisa at by 1949 binuo nila ang Philippine Federation of Christian Churches. Na sana paghilumin ang mga sugat, bunga ng politika ng gera ng dalawang magkabilang panik kaya <clears throat> nabuo ang nasabing federation na ito. At kung mapapansin po ninyo ay uh, they have dropped the word evangelical at ipinalit nila yung word Christian churches. Mayroong mga usapin na uh, kinakailangan uh, ika nga ay uh, ayusin nila sa kanilang pagkakaisa. Subalit, hindi rin ito na nakita na magiging matagal ang pagkakaisa ito. Kaya napag-isip-isip nila na magbuo pa uli ng isang uh, ano, ika nga ay magiging uh, isang simba, isang grupo ng uh, kapatiran ng mga simbahan dito sa Pilipinas upang uh, i-capture yung mga pangangailangan ng pagkakaisa <coughs> ng mga simbahan dito sa Pilipinas. So by 1963, November, <coughs> nabuo ang National Council of Churches in the Philippines. At uh, noong uh, 2019, ay ang ika-25 convention o general convention ng, uh, ng NCCP ay nangyari. Kaya mga kapatid, ano kaya yung sa una ang uh, nakikita nila na magiging aim ng NCCP? Sa libro ni Peter Going, isa sa mga profesor ng Silliman University Divinity School, ito yung kanyang sinabi tungkol sa aim ng NCCP to foster growth of ecumenical interest among the denominations. Uh, ikalawa, to advance the search for Christian unity. Pangatlo, to present a unified stand and action on religious, moral, and social issues. Pangapat, to protect basic human rights. Panglima, to uphold separation of church and state. Ang anim, to promote closer ties with other ecumenical bodies around the world. At pang pito, to promote mutual acceptable cooperative programs. Ang mga tunguhing ito ng National Council of Churches ang nagbigkis simula 1963 hang onwards kung ano ang magiging buhay ng uh, kapatiran na ito ng mga simbahan. Nagpaalala ito sa atin na sa kanyang batang edad bilang isang kapatiran ng mga simbahan, mahalaga sa kanila ang mga usapin internal sa mga simbahan. Ikalawa, usapin sa lipunan. At ang ikatlo, usapin sa mga pangangilangan upang protektahan ang karapatan ng mamamayan. Itong tatlong ito ang makikita natin na napakahalaga sa tunguhin ng kapatiran ng NCCP. Later on, makikita natin na pinagun- tinignan nila yung ng NCCP ang vision, uh, pangangailangan upang eh, itahak uli ang landas ng pagkakapatiran na ito. Ang vision nito, life in all its fullness is what Jesus Christ lived and died for. Yan ang vision na yung life in fullness. Pangalawa na ipinakita rin sa pagbabago ng ilang uh, ika nga ay konting uh, pag-aayos ng tunguhin ng NCCP. Our faith and vision moves us to be an ecumenical fellowship of churches to be a channel for united witness and common action by being in solidarity with the people in the struggle for justice, peace, and integrity of creation. Mga kapatid, dito natin nakikita na ang mahalaga para sa kapatiran na ito na kinasabi kanina pa sa sulat ni uh, Peter Going yung internal, yung pangangailangan ng mga simbahan, pangangailangan ng kapatiran at ang pagprotekta ng karapatan ng ating kapwa, ng ating mamamayan. Doon na sentro ang mga programa ng NCCP. Kaya dahilan dito, mapapansin po natin, 
ito yung nakita na pangangailangan nila na nakita nilang ito ang magbibigay sa amin ng tamang direksyon. At sabi ito ng mga naunang namuno, the mainline Philippine evangelicals find in the new council one of their greatest assets, harnessing and directing the drive of cooperation and unity. So nakita nila na yung tunguhin na ito magiging dahilan ng pagkakaisa. Magiging dahilan ng pagsasamahan, pagtutulungan ng buong kapatiran. At ito ay hindi lamang sa loob ng kapatiran kung hindi maging sa labas ng National Council of Churches. It will extend even to those who are not members of the NCCP. Gusto ko lang malaman natin na kung sino-sino ang mga naging miyembro ng NCCP. Una, Apostolic Catholic Church, which is the recent one of the recent members, the Philippine Lutheran Church, Uh, Convention of Philippine Baptist Churches na nakabay sa Iloilo, United Church of Christ in the Philippines, Iglesia Unida Ecumenical, United Methodist Church, Iglesia Filipina Independiente, Salvation Army, uh, uh, Yemelif, at saka Philippine Episcopal Church o Episcopal Church of the Philippines in the Philippines. At mayroon pa tayong mga associate members na hindi ko na nabanggit o hindi ko nababanggitin para hindi masyadong maging mahaba. Ganun pa man, malaki ang naging role ng mga associate members para sa pagpapalago ng kapatiran ng National Council of Churches. Dahil lang dito, nakita ko mga kapatid na ang NCCP ay ang kanyang tunguhin ay upang ipakita ang totoong ministry ng kapatiran na ito na siyang advocacy na rin niya mismo. Kaya maging sa buong buhay ng, uh, uh, ano, ng kapatiran na ito, ipinakita niya true to his word ang kanyang mga gawain na nagpapakita ng pag, uh, paglaban para sa karapatan ng mga Oh, mayan. Pangangailangan tungo sa pang ano, pagtugon sa pangangailangan ng mga simbahan at ang kung ano ang makapagpapalago sa kanyang kapatiran. Una, tingnan natin. Internal po ito ng mga programa na siyang nagdo-draw ika nga sa mga miyembro ng NCCP. Ikalawa, mga pagkapangkaraniwan at uh, usual na programa ng NCCP po ito. At kung mapapansin po ninyo, ito ay nagawa at nangyari kahit sa panahon ng lockdown. Ang ibig sabihin, hindi ho tumigil ang CCP at hindi siya pinatigil ng pandemya. At marami pa rito na makikita natin na maging sa loob ng pandemya, inindorso ng ating General Secretary ang pagbubuo ng mga pantries sa mga local churches sa ating kapatiran. At ito po ay nangyari. Tumugon ang mga simbahan upang uh, uh, kahit pa paano, kahit paniwari, matugunan ang gutom na, na, na nagbabanta bunga ng lockdown. Kaya mapapansin na maging doon sa ilang pang mga mas pahalagang usapin upang matunungan ang mga mamamayan, nakita ito na pangangailangang mak magampanan ng NCCP at lalo tigit sa mga panahon ng mga sakuna. Uh, ako po ay witness ng pag-turnover uh, ng mga housing projects na kung saan nag-facilitate ang NCCP at ito ay nakatulong sa mga mamamayan, hindi lamang sa mga miyembro ng kapatiran. At nakita natin ito sa Leyte sa Samar at sa iba't iba pang mga lugar na kung saan nagkaroon po ng sakuna. And lately, makikita po natin ito sa Southern Leyte na kung saan isa ito sa mga naging sentro ng hagupit ng Bagyong Udet. Dito, uh, ang, ang kapatiran ng NCCP 
was active, papaano, matulungan, hindi lamang ang mga miyembro ng kapatiran, kundi maging yung mga nasa labas na nangangailangan ng tulong. Again, mga pro, kapatid, mga programa po ito na nakita ng ating kapatiran na kailangan upang tumugon sa mga panawagan ng panahon. Una, tungkol sa katutubo. Ikalawa, tungkol sa mga nangyayari sa ating lipunan. At ang katlo ay tungkol sa selebrasyon ng ikalimandaang taon ng kristyanismo dito sa Pilipinas. At ito ay uh, dinagdagang pa ng napakaraming programa, mga kapatid. At sapagkat uh, nakikita ng NCCP na hindi po pwedeng manahimik na tayo ay maging tagapakinig na lamang ng kung ano ang nangyayari sa labas. Kinakailangan maging involved sa lipunan at maging yung pagkalat ng mga fake news ay kinakailangang bakahin upang maipakita, maituro at malaman ang kung ano ang totoo na nangyayari. Sa pamamagitan nito, tinanggap ng NCCP ang hamon ng ating panahon. Sa pamamagitan nito, ipinakita na ang mandate ng bawat, uh, uh, bawat officers ng NCCP ay kanyang ginagampanan na maging ang pagtulong sa ibang mga sektor, ibang mga kapatid sa ibang simbahan upang maipadama ang tama, ang totoo at pinaing ng mamamayan. Ganyan po ang ginawa ng NCCP. That's how we actualize our ecumenical ministry. That's how we would like to see us, uh, people see us, how we would like to live the kind of ecumenism that we would like to espouse. Kaya, nawa, tulungan natin ang NCCP sapagkat isa sa kanyang ano, advocacy ay ang may pagpatuloy at Kristo sapagkat tinaniniwalaan ng NCCP na ito lamang ang isa sa mga magiging susi kung paano mariresolba ang mga hidwaan sa loob ng ating lipunan. Masama lang mga kapatid dahil sa sometimes ito ay ika nga ay misunderstood by others. Kaya hindi rin nalalayo na naging naretag ang ating kapatiran, ang National Council of Churches. Ito ang uh, uh, nakita natin na sa ating pagsasalita tungkol sa mga panga, panga, mangyayari, nangyayari sa lipunan, ay nagkaroon ng mga retagin. Kaya nawa, maunawaan ito na we are just doing what is our mandate. We are just doing what the gospel imperative is saying to us. So therefore, sana mailayo ang mga namumuno sa atin sa kung ano man ang verification na pinapakita sa atin sa ngayon. Sa mga katwin, mga kapatid, ang NCCP, hindi kami nagsasabi na we have the the only franchise to be called the ecumenical movement. Yan ang gusto lang namin ipakita. But we will try to live out the true meaning of what is ecumenical movement. Yan po yung gusto namin may ipakita sa sambayan natin. Ikalawa, we will collectively try to contribute in the building up of an ecumenical constituency. Although we are an ecumenical constituency, we would like it to double, triple, until all people will know and understand what ecumenical movement is to serve our people. Pangatlo, we will collectively contribute, uh, try to contribute in the building up of a Filipino citizenry who believe in God and embrace their faith, uphold the dignity of their God-given rights. Ito mga kapatid, that's how I, I see 
nakikita namin kung ano ang ibig sabihin ng ecumenical movement within the NCCB. Kaya sa paniniwala namin, we at the NCCB would like to reach out to you, to the whole world, connecting us through our ministries and our purposes. Sa paniniwala namin, yan po yung napakahalaga na mensahe ng National Council of Churches para sa kaniyang mga miyembro, para sa buong bansa, at para sa buong mundo na ang NCCP stands for an extended view of what is brotherhood, sisterhood is to embrace the unembraceable, to love the unlovable. Magandang hapon po, mga kapatid. Maraming salamat po, Bishop Joel, sa inyong pag tatalakay sa beginnings po ng ating National Council of Churches in the Philippines. Uh, kung may mga clarifications po tayo mamaya o questions ay pwede naman pong i-drop na natin sa ating Zoom chat o kaya ay i-reserve natin yan at the end of the last speaker po. Please remain. Uh, at this point po, salamat po again Bishop Joel. And ngayon po ay proceed po tayo sa next natin na uh, speaker uh, yun po, si Reverend Dr. Uh, Aldrin M. Peñamora is the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches uh, Executive Director of Justice, Peace and Reconciliation Commission and the Theological Commission. He is also the Executive Director of the PCEC Affiliated Center for the Study of Christian Muslim Relations. He studied philosophy during, during college at San Beda and earned his uh, Master of Divinity and Master of Theology at Asian Seminary of Christian Ministries in Makati and Asia Graduate School of Theology and Asian Theological Seminary in Quezon City, respectively. He took his PhD in theology, concentrating in Christian, Christian ethics at Fuller Theological Seminary in the United States. He is an affiliate faculty of AGST as a writer. Two books from Langham Publishers, which he co-edited, are forthcoming this year. Uh, ito po yung Christian eth uh, Asian Christian Ethics, Evangelical Perspectives, and Faith and Bayad Evangelical Engagements in the Philippine Context. Uh, Reverend Dr. Aldrin is an ordained minister of the Conservative Baptist Association of the Philippines and is married to Christine Ching Pinyamor. Let us welcome our second speaker to speak about the beginnings of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches, Reverend Dr. Aldrin Pinyamor. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon po sa lahat. Salam, uh, salamat kapatid na Klein. Um, Kinagagala ko po to, to be with you all sa napaka-importante po na event na ito at uh, um, salamat din po Bishop Joel sa inyong napakagandang presentation and uh, looking forward to also po kay uh, Father Quazon uh, for his presentation regarding po sa ating mga ecumenical engagements and histories ng ating mga nabibilangan. Um, allow me to share po yung aking uh, PowerPoint Nawa po ay, uh, okay ba naman po yung aking uh, sound? Sana po malakas. Okay. Yes po. Okay, thank you. Okay, nakikita na po ninyo. Yes po. Okay. Thank you at uh, salamat din Pastora Irma, Rev Irma for the invitation. So ito pong aking uh, i-share ay uh, may kling um, overview ng history ng ecumenical uh, sa so yung development po no, ng ecumenical uh, engagement ng Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. At uh, makikita po natin dito sa aming website, we have our uh, member bodies and uh, according to our um, 
So I mean, pong statistics, we have uh, 78 denominations and 200 plus organizations na kasapi po sa Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. Um, so of course, alam po natin na that the history ng uh, paano po nabuo ito, gaya po what uh, Bishop Joel mentioned, and po hindi basta-basta po ito nangyari, it didn't happen overnight, but uh, many things happened during the years para po magkaroon ng ganitong kapulungan or organization. So I hope to uh, be able to share some key insights and uh, events para po sa pangyayari na ito. Uh, as I was preparing, I uh, stumbled and saw Bishop Noel Pantoja's um, post sa kanyang uh, Facebook page um, regarding uh, a meeting they had sa Philippine Interfaith Movement Against Human Trafficking. Uh, I think it happened, the date is January 28. So uh, ito po yung isa sa... Um, very active ang Philippine count, ang PCEC in uh, its ecumenical uh, participation ano po, sa PMAT. At uh, titignan po natin ano, sapagkat, as I mentioned, yung history po ay bago dumating sa ganito na ang sasaya po ng kanilang mga itsura. Hindi po ba? Sa, at alam po natin, even as right now, we are very happy to be with, with each other. But uh, may rami pong nadaanan. Bago po nagkaganito. Okay. So allow me to share. Ano po, because um, na, very tied up po ang uh, development ng PCEC sa American scene. Yung siyempre po yung kanyang pinanggalingan. Marami po sa mga member groups that were uh, crucial in the establishment of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches really are from the United States. Ano po. And uh, isa pong... Uh, matinding usapin na from the late 19th century, so counting pagbabalik lamang po tayo doon sa panahon na yon, is the modernist or the liberal fundamental or evangelical divergence ano po, pagdating sa uh, usaping theolog theological no po, or theological conversations. As modernism during that time, we emphasized God's immanence over transcendence and rejected the supernatural. And it also questioned the divine authorship, authority, and inspiration of the Bible. Ito po yung tinatawag nating mga criticism, ano po, biblical criticism or critical methods. Emphasized human progress through reason and the sciences that led to rejecting traditional eschatology so that uh, yung pong sa modernist standpoint, uh, ang naging emphasis sa panahon na yun ay yung social gospel na yung pong fundamental and evangelical group. They were trying to emphasize what they called was the, the, the pure gospel. At makita po natin yung development niyan. Ano po. Okay. So yun po isang naging um, matinding usapin sa pagkakahiwahiwalay ng grupo sa Amerika na nagkaroon din po ng malaking impact sa atin dito. When they came, na carry po, carry over yung conversation na yon and even the influence ng ganong pag-iisip. Kung kaya um, yung modernist uh, fundamentalist schism sa US uh, resulted sa US in the establishment of fundamentalist or evangelical Christian schools, humiwalay po sila dun sa nakikita nilang ang tingin nila naging liberal. Kaya po yung Dallas Theological Seminary, many of our evangelical leaders, of course, uh, have studied there. Westminster Theological Seminary, which next split po sa Princeton, the Princeton Theological Seminary. In 1929, it was established. At yun pong Association of Baptists for Evangelism in the Orient, or ABEO, ay natatag din po as a response to that uh, uh, pag yung divergence. Ano po? Yung Abeyo po, as we will see, uh, this is a very crucial uh, organization sa pagtatatag po ng uh, fundamentalism or uh, the fundamental um, Baptists dito po sa atin. Okay? Now, another factor uh, sa PCEC po, yun pong when we look back at history, is the resurgence of the Gospel Proclamation Ministry na... Dulot po ito nung pagkaka, um, pagdating or the arrival of the Pentecostals in the 
uh, religious or uh, evangelical uh, uh, Christian scene. Uh, Assemblies of God was established in 1914, but of course earlier pa po, ano, as a result of the Great Awakenings, uh, you know, earlier uh, events at uh, 1906 with the Azusa Revival and ganyan po. Um, ito pong uh, uh, ganitong mode, ano po, yung proclamation, the emphasis on spreading the gospel kahit kanino po, kahit saan, kahit nasa street. This was really, uh, you know, one of the hallmarks and the giftings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, was a, It's one of the hallmarks of, Pentecost, of the Pentecostal faith. And revivalistic Christianity became prominent. Isa po rito, um, is a Charles Fuller, dun po sa kanyang uh, um, radio na about the revival. Ano po. So, um, This ha had an impact din, din po to the kind of uh, evangelical Christianity that will soon be formed sa Philippines. Kaya po maganda rin tignan ito is because um, na, na ulit din po ito sa atin, yung ganitong conversation at uh, influence. So as a reaction to fundamentalism, which was separatist po or isolationist, a new breed emerged in the United States. They call themselves the New Evangelicals. Ito po yung pinabibilangan ni Carl Henry, Billy Graham, of course, kilalang kilala po natin, Charles Fuller, as I mentioned kanina, who was the founder of, uh, the Fuller, of Fuller Theological Seminary. Nagkaroon din po sila ng break dun sa fundamentalist um, group. So they call themselves the New Evangelicals. Ito pong New Evangelicals would be very uh, influential naman sa atin. As you know, um, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham, you know, they are uh, talagang uh, mga tinitingala ng mga ebangheliko dito po sa atin dahil sa kanilang influence. At um, that group, the New Evangelicals, they uh, uh, established what came to be known as the National Association of Evangelicals in 1942. So this was during pre-war period. And it was committed to evangelism. By evangelism, it's more on the, of course, the proclamation ministry of the gospel. Billy Graham is very, uh, uh, we know him for that. To address social concerns, dahil po ang nakita ng mga new evangelicals in comparison to the fundamentalists uh, ay yung para po mahina pagdating dun sa social concerns during the time. So they want to address that. Of course, they adhere to fundamentalist doctrines about Bible, God, yung pong, uh, when we say Bible, yung pong talagang uh, inerrant, infallible, you know, the doctrine of inspiration, ganyan po. And high standards in theological training. So that uh, Fuller was established because of that in 1947. At ang uh, mga, yung pong expansion ay naging napakahalaga. By that, uh, it means uh, kailangan pong mag-expand ang uh, through the proclamation of the gospel, not only in the U.S. but around the world. Kaya po, nagkaroon din ng mga, magkakaroon po ng mga conferences like the Lausanne, as I will mention later, na gathering all the evangelicals around the globe. Okay. Key conference, of course, is the Lausanne of 1974, led by Billy Graham and John Stott. It produced the Lausanne Covenant With John Stott as uh, the chief architect, yung background story po niyan ay uh, si John Stott po was really insisting on um, also putting emphasis on social action at hindi lang dun po sa proclamation side of the gospel. So in paragraph 5, nandun po sa Lausanne Covenant that we affirm that evangelism and socio-political involvement are both parts of our Christian duty. For both are necessary expressions of our doctrines of God and man, our love for our neighbor, and our obedience to Jesus Christ, the message of salvation implies, also a message of judgment upon every form of alienation, oppression, and discrimination, and we should, uh, we should be, not be afraid to, now, to denounce evil and injustice wherever they exist. So may kita po natin dito by the time na, na so solidify yung new evangelicals or the, you know, the evangelical movement or Christianity, 
nagkakaroon na po ng balanse pagdating po sa proclamation and social action. Okay. Um, sa Philippines po, uh, the, in the Philippines scene, ito, uh, post World War II, of course, uh, marami na pong nangyari before World War II, mostly po, ano, napaka matindi ng action pagdating po sa ating kapatid sa NCCP, mainline Protestants na, you know, all the conciliar and the unification ay nangyari before World War II. Um, marami na pong moves na nangyari pero sa mga fundamentals and evangelicals ay hindi pa po ganun ka-active ka yung ganong klaseng movement. But there were some groups that arrived after the Second World War na naging katalis din po toward that kind of unification. At malaki din po yung effect ng formation ng NCCP. Dahilan po sa ito ay nag, um, it prompted the evangelicals and the fundamentalists to, uh, to have their own uh, similar uh, na council. So some of the groups that arrived after the Second World War were Kamakop, the, you know, the Christian Alliance, uh, Christian uh, Alliance uh, missions and uh, Alliance missions. Uh, no, sorry po. Ano, na, ito po yung sa Alliance Church ano, uh, ng Philippines and galing from the CMA, Christian Missionary Alliance sa US. Um, so by 1947, yung Philippine uh, um, organization was uh, established. Kaya po yung may opidon of the Philippines. And the, and the Far East Gospel Crusade, later sent international, I also they arrived in 1947. PBIAS, Far Eastern Bible Institute and Seminary, was established in 1948. At ito po yung uh, ang, uh, ang golden ay maging uh, malawak sana. In non-denominational but uh, of course adhering to the evangelical fundamentalist ano pa rin. Um, CBAP, the Conservative Baptist Association of the Philippines, 1961. OMF, Southern Baptist Convention. Um, uh, convention, 1950 and 51. So ito po yung some of the groups. I'm sure there are others also. Pero they have, uh, dito po ay makita na natin yung uh, mga grupo na magiging um, crucial sa PCC. Now, some of the key issues that separated mainline Protestants and fundamentalists and evangelicals kasi po yung uh, historically yung pong pag-establish ng PCEC ay uh, reaction po unang-una between the fundamentalists and the uh, evangelicals din, dun po sa grupo na yun. At pangalawa, in, con in uh, their uh, relationship with uh, mainline Protestants. Yun po, no? So yung issue of ecumenism was crucial dahil po sa tingin ng fundamentalists and evangelicals during that time ay may pagka-separatist po no? yung, yung stand. Kailangan pong ma-evangelize lahat. You know, uh, doesn't matter kung anong religion, we need to make the gospel known. Ganun po yung mindset. Theological issues, as I mentioned kanina, role of American missions in the Philippines ay mahalaga din sapagkat uh, yung mga missionaries, karamihan po, as um, Bishop Joel mentioned, ano, yung mga missionaries din po ay um, marami sa mga naunang iglesia ay after World War II, nagkakaroon na po ng move toward independence, ano, self-sustainability ng mga churches. But sa evangelic, by this time, ay uh, marami pa pong dumarating from American group at magiging yun nga po they are crucial in the establishment of the PCEC kaya magkaiba po yung ano doon ano? Um, evangelism versus dialogue as I mentioned evangelism naging focus po talaga ng mga evangelicals and fundamentalist fundamentalism or fundamentalist groups kaya po um, hindi lang po dialogue but really the sharing proclaiming kahit kanina po ayan so um, it was in that scene that the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches in the Philippines uh, was born. You know? uh, it prompted, uh, yung pong, as I mentioned, you know, yung pagkakagawa ng NCCP ay uh, naging, ano din siya, naging factor para magkaroon ng National Council ang evangelicals. Um, 
Other key reasons was, were, uh, were to defend the fundamentalist doctrine, evangelization of the country, need for holistic ministry, and need for a distinct witness in the public sphere. So, hindi lamang po evangelization, but malaki na po dito yung impact na nangyayari sa United States about a holistic ministry and distinct witness in the public sphere. So, in 1964, the PCFC or the Philippine Council of Fundamental Churches was formed, headed by uh, Bishop Antonio Ormeo. This was the forerunner of the PCEC. And later that year, nagkaroon po ng uh, pag-uusap that it should be uh, uh, broader. Yung po bang PCFC, del fundamentalist na nakasulat doon, sabi ng mga evangelical, evangelicals, kailangan evangelicals din. So it was changed to Philippine Council of Fundamentalist and evangelical churches. So the formation of PCFEC during that time was seen by the Fundamentalist Association, AFBCFP, ito po yung Association of Fundamentalist Baptist Churches in the Philippines, na nakita nila na parang ito'y compromise. So actually, si Bishop uh, Dr. Armeo and uh, uh, three other groups with him, bali three churches, uh, they were ousted from membership dahil lang po sa ang tingin ay uh, yun nga, uh, they are diluting the fundamentalist faith. Um, okay. So uh, the persistent fundamentalist evangelical tension amplified with the inclusion of the Pentecostals dahil dun sa PCFEC, in-include ang Pentecostals, lalo na pong uminit ang usapan. At uh, dahil doon ay uh, ang uh, fundamentalist group ay uh, kumbaga eh, essentially hindi na po sila nagpa-participate so that later on in 1969 PCFEC yung fundamental word ay dinrap na rin so it only that's the name Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches although 1965 yung parang sabihin na natin birth talaga officially but the name was in 1969 so, um, in 1978 to 1993, Dr. June Benzer's term as a general secretary um, brought some important innovations to the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches Ministry. Pangunahin po rito yung formation ng PILRADS, Philippine Relief and Development Services. Ito po yung social development arm of PCEC na talaga po napaka-active um, serving, you know, uh, uh, yung mga nasa lanta, sa Pondoy, and you know, mga typhoon. Um, we were there also when the Marawi siege um, happened. Nagdala po kami ng relief dun sa mga surrounding barangays. It's through the field rides and in partnership with other evangelical groups. Ano po? Um, participation in the National Ecumenical Consultative Committee, yung NECCOM, which was formed by President Aquino. Uh, it's an ecumenical group, so Magkakasama po rito si na Dr. Benzer with our uh, Catholic and NCCP uh, uh, partners dito po sa NECOM na ito. And I think there were other, there were other uh, religious organizations represented. At um, in uh, Dr. June Benzer's time, addressing social issues and publications such as divorce, war, and human rights concerns were also addressed, although hindi pa po ganun kalawa. So... Um, so ito po sa PBS or Philippine Bible Society, isa pong engagement, ano po, si Dr. Federico Magbanwa, the third picture on the left sa taas, naging uh, uh, president po nito nung simula 1974. So makita po natin, ano, na nagsisimula na pong PCEC to be active in some areas ano, sa ecumenical engagements niya. Uh, eh, si uh, Bishop Tendero, uh, sorry, okay. Bishop Tendero started uh, to be the GenSec, later changed to National Director in 2015. Uh, from 1993 to 2015, at dito po, we uh, see how PCEC has become more active in social, political, and ecumenical engagement as part of its witness or martyria, according to Dr. Benzer's functional church, ano, na engagement, engagement or witness in the public square. The Peace and Reconciliation Commission, PARCOM, was created in 2011, headed by Reverend Dan uh, Lacan Sumulong Pantoha. And here we see 
na si Bishop F is with Chairman Mohagarik Bali and Professor Abudjed Linga um, engaging them regarding the peace talks on the Bangsamoro issue. Uh, he also became the con co-convenor, si Bishop F, with uh, Bishop uh, Broderick Pabilio in Task Force 2010, which is concerned with electoral reforms and voter education. And since 2011, ang PCEC po has, be has been a core member of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, or PEPP, um, uh, in uh, doing its best to foster ano po, yung peaceful relations and to strike a peace between the GRP and the NDFP. In 2013, PCEC through Bishop Tendero partnered with um, Bishop Roderick Pabilio and NCCP's Bishop Rex Reyes in forming ito po yung PMAT, the Philippine Interfaith Movement Against Human Trafficking. And also from 2013, uh, PCEC has been a co-convener of the Interfaith Dialogue on Climate Change with Archbishop Tony Ledesma under the late Senator Herson. Alvarez, the yung kanya pong Climate Change Commission. So ito po isang picture ni, uh, ng, uh, with the PEP dialogue, nandiyan po si GPH panel chair Alex Padilla, si Bishop, then uh, not yet the PCC Bishop, si uh, Bishop Noel, was still being you know, groomed at the time when this happened in 2013. Okay. By uh, the time of uh, Bishop Noel, um, as national director, PCEC continue, has continued to support the ecumenical engagements that were initiated during Bishop F's leadership. In 2016 and 2017, for example, then um, Bishop Noel and PCEC leaders visited the uh, MILF chairman Al Haj Murad Ibrahim and the MILF, MILF Central Committee to deepen the bond of peace between evangelicals and the Bangsamoro people. Also, because of that, the Joint Working Group of Religious Leaders for Peace through PCECJ Partom was born para po um, uh, broaden yung initiative of peace building. At kasama po rito ang Catholic Church, UCCP, and uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints uh, initiative na ito. So here is a picture of uh, Bishop Noel with uh, Chairman Murad, now um, uh, Chief Minister, Barn Chief Minister, um, Murad Ibrahim. Uh, Dito po yan, sa camp, dun po sa Camp Darapanan. And also, um, it was during, uh, you know, the naging active din po ang PCEC dun sa March for Truth and Justice for CJ Sereno. Uh, kasama po ang multi-sectoral groups. Alam ko po, magkakasama po tayo dyan. Okay. Ito po yung uh, meeting, one meeting at UCCP Cosmopolitan, si uh, Archbishop Tony. Ledesma, sa kaliwa po yung mga representatives ng AMILF religious group at uh, ang uh, representatives po ng uh, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints sa kanan. Of course, nandiyan po si Kuya Al or si Rev Al at si Rev Kalu Kamanda, ano po, who hosted yung uh, meeting na ito sa Cosmo. Um, a few slides left and the uh, I'd just like to point out also how PCEC joined and uh, 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 is a core member of the Interfaith Agape Fellowship, seeking to support a fair and just legislation to protect the LGBT community. Yan po yung picture sa kanan where uh, nandito po uh, ang representative ng Catholic Church, uh, Prof. Dr. Bong Baybado, nandiyan si, um, Dok, uh, si Father Richard Babao at of course uh, ang Church of Jesus Christ the Latter-day Saints and the LGBT community representative siya po yung si Sister Ging ito po nasa may baba um, so uh, as a core member of the ecumenical group Anawim also we have part we partner with the Catholic Church and then CCP yan po yung picture sa kanan uh, a meeting with uh, some members of the families of the JK victims at Huling picture po rito, yung amin pong, atin pong partnership with the UniHarmony Partners Manila. Ito pong picture with Cardinal Tagle and uh, uh, Imam Bashir doon po sa Quiapo Grand Mosque, sa Mosque Golden. So um, ito po yung uh, maikling his history, no, kasaysayan ng paano po nag, uh, lumawig yung uh, pag-engage um, pag ng PCEC sa 
iba yung sa atin po no sa atin po ecumenical body at uh, isa po ditong um siguro po sa question and answer I can elaborate din po ano po yung some theological and uh, um, mga foundations kung paano po ito nangyari but uh, alam ko po time is uh, of the essence so dito ko na po muna tatapusin ang ating presentation at muli po salamat sa invitation God bless po Maraming salamat po, uh, Dr. Aldrin, sa inyong presentation. Uh, yes, thank you po sa input talaga. It's actually my first time to hear about the, the narrative of uh, the PCEC. Yes, uh, Can we give uh, Doc Aldrin po uh, some reactions like yung heart o kaya ay clap? Let's use our Zoom reactions po. Yun po. Salamat. Maraming salamat. At saka po kay Jensek Porlares kanina po. Let's give our heart and our uh, clap din po. Uh, before we proceed with our next speaker, uh, let us be uh, inspired by a song by UCCP pastors, Dingin Mosana, uh, by Gropong Pendo. kasakima at karasa ng naghahari ang pag-asang nahasik sa mga puso ay binuhawi ang bigay ninyong yaman sabay pinagkait may api sa kabila ng kasaganahan Yes. 
Salamat po sa ating mga pastors from the United Church of Christ in the Philippines for that uh, song na kanilang uh, binigay sa ating hapon, sa atin ngayon, ngayong hapon na ito. So to continue with our input this afternoon is our third speaker, uh, Reverend Father Rolando A. Tuazon, CM, Congregatio Misyon. Missionist or Congregation of the Mission is a Filipino, Filipino Vincentian priest. He has been recently designated as Dean of the St. Vincent School of Theology Adamson University where he also served as Assistant Dean and Chairperson of the Philosophy Department. Uh, he is the Editor-in-Chief of Hapag, the school's interdisciplinary journal in theology and philosophy. He was assigned at the Santuario de San Vicente de Paul as its project director since 2010 and as parish priest since, it's, since it became a parish in 2012 until 2018. He's a professor of moral theology at St. Vincent School of Theology and became a regular visiting professor at the Seminario Mayor de San Carlos in Cebu and at the Our Lady of the Good Council Seminary in Pampanga and other schools of theology. He has had the opportunity to teach in other schools of theology as well. He has done researches, delivered lectures, and published locally and internationally in the areas of social teachings of the church, narrative and liberation ethics, food security, human rights, sexual violence against women, and environmental ethics. He's a member of the Cateo, an association of Filipino theologians in the Philippines. He has teamed up with the Social Pastoral Institute in giving training on stewardship, spirit quality. He was involved in many years in the work of seminary education. He obtained his bachelor's degree in philosophy at Addison University in 1984, licensed in 2000, and doctorate in 2006 in Moral Theology at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Let us welcome into our uh, virtual space uh, Reverend Father Rolando A. Tuazon. Hey, thank you very much, Kain, uh, for that introduction. Para magandang hapong po sa ating lahat, may request for me to share my screen, please. Thank you. Hello, number. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, magandang hapong po sa ating lahat. 
Uh, maraming maraming salamat po kay Reverend Irma Mepico who invited me uh, to this uh, uh, forum uh, when she actually invited me uh, about almost uh, more than a week ago. I hesitated because uh, this is really not so much an area of my uh, the theological formation. But uh, more, I'm more engaged in ecumenical practice, I uh, have more practical engagement in uh, ecumen ecumenical affairs. Uh, being a member of the uh, Quezon City Ecumenical Fellowship. Um, I would like to thank uh, C. Dr. Aldrin, uh, mm -hmm. PCEC, saka si Bishop Joel Porlares na uh, NCCP. Uh, what I was asked to talk about this afternoon is about the birth of Vatican II and the ecumenical ministry of the CBCP. So, medyo mahaba sana ito, but I would not uh, want to go into the details of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but rather, if you're interested, I can give you a copy. But I would like to highlight some very important uh, points. Uh, what I intend to do basically is uh, just to focus on the birth of Vatican II and of the CBCP, especially the embrace of ecumenism as part of an important turning point and area of renewal in life and mission of the church. Uh, we will try to briefly expound the historical context or background where the two ecclesial bodies uh, were and uh, maybe understand and figure out how both transitioned to a renewed reality. So more or less, the framework natin, we can talk about pre-Vatican or pre-CBCP and then Post Vatican and CBCP. Okay. Um, framework of presentation Vatican II and ecumenism, uh, and then CBCP and ecumenism. Basically, I'll try to talk about historically uh, on, the, on the background, what, we, what was going on before, uh, and how things happened during the event itself, especially with Vatican II and then what actually came after that. So we will do more or less the same thing uh, for CBCP. Okay, I think all of you are very familiar uh, with the Second Vatican Council. You know, I think even among many good number of theologians, kino consider po na ito na isa sa mga pinakamahalagang events sa simbahan ng Roman Catholic Church especially in most recent years. In fact, some people are even saying that here there was a real, um, very, very big shift that happened in the life and even in the self-understanding uh, of the life and mission of the church. Ito po, makikita natin, uh, um, some people would even talk about this as a rapture. Okay, in the historical development of the church. Mm -hmm. But others, of course, like uh, Benedict the Sixtenth would always emphasize that there is really more of a continuity rather than rapture. And some people would say that it's a rapture because what was going on before Vatican II was really almost radically different from how and, and how things transformed uh, after Vatican II. And we will try to briefly explain that in our uh, discussion this afternoon. In this council, there were, for the first time, there were more than 2,500 fathers of the council, uh, bishops from different countries, from all over the world, okay? Theologians, you know, who were assisting their bishops as experts. Uh, there were also, it's important to note uh, that this is the first time uh, that a, an ecumenical council of the church actually was open uh, to some guests who belong to other Christian denominations. Okay, there were some people who were present there as observers. So people would always say, as you can see, how many, you know, uh, they could really be gathered and the main church of the St. Peter's Basilica. 
Okay, so people didn't, you know, taking that as an uh, uh, even looking at, the, at this picture, it gives you an idea that that became really a truly global, universal, and even multicultural in itself. Of course, many of them now wear a common, uh, uh, you know, vestment. But but in reality, when they gather together in informal assemblies, you'd see that it was really multicultural in nature, coming from different continents of the globe. So why was this called? Uh, the whole spirit of, uh, in, uh, of the council uh, was called for because of the need to do updating. You know, it's a Italiano aggiornamento or renewal in the church. We will see that the one who actually convened this was uh, Angelo Roncalli, uh, who became uh, John uh, the 23rd. And only about three months after he was made the Pope, he already announced that uh, he will be calling uh, for a council, He's organizing a council. That was in 1959. He was actually uh, elected Pope end of 1958 and three months after he announced uh, that there will be an ecumenical council. Of course, the preparation took so long, about more than uh, two weeks before they were able to really uh, come up uh, with all the necessary organizations for the council. Okay, so it was convened okay, in January and it was opened uh, on October 11, 1962. And then uh, every year, all the, the participants will be coming back uh, at the beginning of the fall. And then toward uh, December, they will have to go home again. Mm -hmm. and then that was happening until uh, 2000, uh, uh, sorry, until 1965. You know that uh, Pope Angelo Roncalli, Pope John the 23rd actually died uh, in the, in, on December 8, uh, rather, uh, in, in, in 1963, so he was actually replaced by uh, Pope uh, uh, Paul VI, uh, Giovanni Battista Mantini. Okay, now we can say that this Vatican Council was very, very important because it really brought about significant changes in the church. It actually reflected on so many different aspects of the life and mission of the church in such a way that after four years of gathering, they had to produce some somehow 16 documents like decrees, you know, uh, important statements. And among these are the four important constitutions of the church. One, the first one was Sacrosanctum Concilium in 1963, that was the first document that was produced, the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, Lumen Gentium in 1964, Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Dei Verbum in 1965, Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, and also the very, very last document that was produced and was approved by the Council was Gaudium et Spes, the Constitution of the Church in the modern world. Somehow this became the, one of the most controversial uh, documents uh, because it really defined how the church more or less could uh, in a way connect with the modern world, with modernism, with liberalism, etc. So um, some significant changes happened. Like for example, this became, became pretty obvious, especially for the faithful uh, because they would have very significant changes in the way they would practice their form of worship. Early on before Vatican II, there was emphasis on sacredness of liturgy as a means of salvation, care in keeping liturgy uniform. Latin was used throughout the world. Priests uh, in a way perform and laity only observed. 
Well, after Vatican II, many liturgical changes happened. The, the celebration became, you know, was, was done in the vernacular languages and uh, the emphasis on people's participation actually became the more important thing, especially uh, allowing also uh, lay people to be involved in ministries, you know, as lay lectors, ministers of the Eucharist, etc. Also, because of uh, the, the final document of Gaudium et Spes, uh, you see that before Vatican II, uh, the real focus was on the scholasticism, okay, uh, that defined the kind of education that seminarians would have to do, would have to have. And then, in a way, new learning, especially influenced by modernism and liberalism, were really held under suspicion. But after Vatican II, okay, you see that there was greater tolerance for different kinds of learning, for dialogue with modern world, uh, for new forms of spirituality. Imagine at the beginning of the 20th century, you would see an anti-modernist movement in the church wherein some bishops actually uh, were really running after theologians or biblical scholars who actually would not toe the line of the church. And many were actually excommunicated with a very a kind of orientation that they had eventually found their own expression during the Second Vatican Council. I think it is important to note that there was one Cardinal, Cardinal Franz Koenig, who actually was in charge of the church's relation to other religions or to other uh, faith, uh, Christian faith denominations. And he stressed that part of the experience and transformation that happened in the church because of the Second Vatican Council is in the area of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. He claims before church is considered only as the true church of Jesus, no toleration of error, Catholics were barred uh, from reading works written by Protestant reformers. You cannot even enter and pray with other uh, people of other faiths. But then after Vatican II, because of, the, of Vatican II, ecumenical spirit was encouraged. There was freedom of inquiry, joint study groups, joint prayer services, common editions of the Bible, respect for dignity of others, okay? intercommunion in some cases, if allowed by the bishop. According to uh, Cardinal Franz Koenig, he said that there are at least he named four important breakthroughs of renewal in the church. Liturgical renewal, support for ecumenism, emphasis of the lay apostolate, and then fourth revolutionary approach in the relationship between the church and between, uh, sorry, between and, and the non-Christian religions. Okay, one would wonder uh, how this, how was the church before Vatican II uh, especially in relation uh, to the relationship with other Christian believers. You would see that uh, Vatican II, actually, uh, before we go into that, I think we, we would have to, to, to emphasize that during Vatican II, it actually produced two very, very important documents. Uh, one is Unitatis Red Integratio, we, uh, talks about ecumenism and it talks about you know the concept of a world church okay and which is mentally uh, mental ment mentality that would define uh, ecumenism okay uh, it's rather rather than expect all Christians to simply return to the Catholic Church there is more of an attitude of reconciliation and reunion over the Catholic uh, Church joins with other Christians seeking that unity uh, for which Christ prayed. Okay, makita natin yun. And also, uh, so this particular document was uh, approved in 1964 and, and it was voted upon by 2,137 okay, uh, uh, for a decree and there were only 11 who were against this. Another very important document that, that came out of the Second Vatican Council was Nostra Etate, a declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions. 
Here it talks about, okay, a greater consideration of the church relationship to Judaism against the back, backdrop of the Holocaust and to other world faiths. Jews are to be respected as elder brothers and sisters in faith, okay? And that's the reason why there was really a kind of a dramatic uh, resistance to what actually prevailed before Vatican II, which was anti-Semitism, okay? And so now we have uh, the, the Bible, okay, of the Jews, okay, uh, becoming part so much of our liturgy, and then we need to be able to, recon to consider them as our uh, predecessor of our faith. Uh, it was approved also in 1965, okay, uh, already during the time of Paul VI. Before Vatican, uh, before Vatican II, renewal was actually going on in certain aspects of life of the church. You could see that what happened in Vatican II in a way had certain antecedents in terms of certain movements of renewal. There was renewal, for example, in the field of systematic theology. There were a lot of attempts of going back to the Bible, to the fathers of the church and to the historical resources. And, and here that we see also uh, kind of a um, uh, kind of a movement of renewal in liturgy, okay, liturgical movement with roots in France and in the Benedictine tradition, focused on liturgical renewal, okay, especially developed by German and Austrian uh, liturgiologists. And there was also a kind of renewal in biblical studies, okay. Um, so we can see that what was what was going on in the sec uh, before Vatican uh, II, there were already some areas of some groups trying to do this, and eventually, uh, what happened is that this dominant, uh, what was actually at the margins, eventually found expression in the main uh, stream thinking of the church. But it is interesting that during this particular renewal. Okay, in those different areas, okay, those uh, developments happened in exchange or in dispute with the theologians of other denominations who actually were already very active in ecumenical movement. I would just like to show uh, some representations of the ecumenical movement that uh, preceded Vatican II. For example, you are familiar with, uh, with the World Missionary Conference and uh, 1910 in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, okay? You have, for example, uh, uh, the cosmopolitan, uh, 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 the, the ecumenical patriarch, Germanos of Constantinople, he published in 1926 an encyclical of the Eastern Orthodox, and he claimed that to the churches of Christ everywhere, and that's, that a particular encyclical suggests that we can talk of a fellowship of churches similar to that of the League of Nations, the uh, after the antecedent of the United Nations. And the World Conference of Life and Work, okay, uh, that started in Stockholm, Sweden, on social cooperation among the different churches, okay, this happened in 1925, participated in by many Christian movements. Okay, of, of, of Christian denominations. And then there was the establishment of the World Council of Churches. Okay. Makita natin aktibo, marami nangyayari, especially among the churches uh, of the Protestant groups. But as far as the church is concerned, the mainstream church, how did it actually take its posture vis-a-vis uh, -vis this development? Makikita po natin that the church was more on a defensive mood to the ecumenical movement, okay? That developed among the Protestant and Orthodox Christians. In 1920, for example, the Vatican declined to cooperate with the life and work movement an attempt of Protestant and Orthodox churches to reach consensus in church's practical role in society, okay? We can also see that Pope Pius X in his encyclical, encyclical Mortalium Animos was actually making a reaction against the first World Conference of Faith and Order in the Sun in 1927, criticizing this movement as pursuing truth as a result of fraternal agreements. This is what he said. 
those wretch, those wretches tainted with error of indifferentism and modernism hold the dogmatic truth is not absolute, but relative. That is, that it must adapt itself to the varying necessities of times and the varying dispositions of souls, since it is not contained in the unchangeable revelation, but is by its very nature meant to accommodate itself to the life of man. So basically, ibang iba yung disposition. Before the foundation of WCC, uh, sorry, WCC, yes, in Amsterdam, in 1948, uh, the Holy See actually issued cum copertum. Ito makita natin, these, these are attempts showing that the church was really not open uh, to this ecumenical movement in the church. Okay? But there was also certain openness, okay, that we can actually identify uh, that eventually became the germ, uh, the, the seed uh, for the possibility of allowing the church to be involved in ecumenical affairs. Okay, in the fourth century, heretic baptism with water in the trian name and with the true intention makes the baptized, in a certain sense, a member of the church. May mga lalunas area ng baptism. Pius the Twelfth, for example, would claim that uh, such baptism done in Trinitarian, with the Trinitarian formula, does not uh, form part of the condemnation of the ex extra ecclesium nulla salus. Okay, okay. There was another statement claimed that all those who are signed uh, with the sacred character of baptism cannot remain disunited and dispersed. Okay, no doubt. Pope Pius XII identifies the Church of Jesus with the Roman Catholic Church, but at the same time, he paved the way for Vatican II. Okay? Although no Catholic was allowed to participate in WCC 1948, it was observed that certain some Catholic observers were given permission to attend the meeting in Edinburgh and also in Lund. Okay. International Circle of Theologians eventually got formed and got organized. Okay, to be able to deal with certain ecumenical questions. Okay, and uh, one very good example is that uh, Monsignor uh, jo Johannes uh, William Brand actually eventually uh, became even a professor of the of one of the institute of WCC. Okay, so makita natin uh, here we'd see that there was a need of reform and tools of reform were ready to get use, okay? And the call of John the 23rd for the council makes use of this ready existing context for the renewal of the church. However, that this would happen in such an eruptive way was only known uh, by the Holy Spirit. That was the statement given by Professor uh, Dr. Dietmer, Dietmar uh, Winkel, Winkler, who actually specializes on ecumenical studies. Okay, so that th those were the words of the Pope himself. Okay, that there is already some conditions for us to be able to get involved in this. So that uh, uh, Cardinal Augustin Bea, Jesuit, who was director of the Pontifical University Institute of Rome, eventually became uh, uh, assigned uh, to work specifically for the promotion of Christian unity, especially as a result of the council. And he did his work with great fervor uh, that he was able to facilitate a lot of processes of encounter between uh, the Roman Catholic Church as well as the different groups, okay? Uh, therefore, we see that John the 23rd and Cardinal Bea could be considered as the two key catalysts for ecumenical renewal in Vatican II. After Vatican II, there were several things that happened. One is the meeting of Pope uh, Paul VI and Patriarch Antenagoras of Constantinople. Okay, that's a celebrated event. Uh, there was also baptism, Eucharist, and ministry known as the Lima document that uh, got uh, published okay, by the World Council of Churches. Okay, and these were some attempts okay, that, uh, uh, in a way, solidified and confirmed the direction of the church to become more ecumenical, especially the document of John Paul II, okay, put unum sent, okay, that was published in that year. And more recently, of course, I am identifying only some key elements that I, I could remember uh, in the development, in the post-Vatican uh, development in ecumenism, 
okay? Uh, the commemora commemoration, for example, of the joint Lutheran Catholic uh, commemoration of the Reformation in, uh, in uh, 2017, that was the 500 years, but in preparation for that, uh, they came up with a document from conflict to communion, okay? So, so we see uh, that there were significant developments there. Now I have only a few minutes left, uh, five minutes. Okay, in, Vatica, uh, in the Philippines, we have the CBCP conference, no? uh, the CBCP, which is started as actually Catholic welfare organization that was organized shortly after the Second World War uh, by the apostolic delegate William Piani, Didi, and uh, Gabriel Reyes of Cebu became its first chairman. Okay, and this eventually became CBCP in January 31, 1968. You have 90, 96 bishops now with plus 41 honorary bishop, 18, 86 jurisdictions, archdiocese, diocese or prelates in the country. And we have uh, the, the, the CBCP actually has produced 460 statements and pastoral letters okay, since 1940. There are 35 commissions and offices. I don't have the time to discuss all of them, but I will just try to focus on the Episcopal Commission on Ecumenical Affairs, which was established in 1968. Okay. Again, if you are going to take a look at the brief historical narrative, it was actually Father uh, Robredilio uh, in his work, The Challenges of the Times and CBCB's response, uh, Responses, a historical essay uh, on the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. He did, uh, stu he studied the different pronouncements coming from the CBCP and he actually identified certain periods uh, in, that, uh, in the life of, of the CBCP. He talks about the period of defensiveness that happened after the Second World War from 1945 to 1965. You see that the, the Manila especially was devastated, okay? Uh, there were, because of the coming of the American Souls, of course, uh, they had uh, more influences in society, and there was also a strong movement of anti-clericalism and also anti-Catholic sentiment, especially uh, with the masonry that you know, the roots of which actually started even uh, with some of our illustrados. American innovation, secular culture and, and control of public education, invasion of Protestant missionaries. They were sent here in great uh, numbers and here, what the church was, uh, the posture that the church, the Catholic church took was that was more of resistance to all of this. Okay. Now, uh, but, but from 1966 to 1965, especially because of Vatican II, the influence of Vatican II in the Philippines, okay, it brought about difficult shift in the church's theological, ecclesiological, and pastoral perspectives in faith and practice. So, uh, of course, within this context, you still continue to have the, challenge, the challenges coming from communism and also from martial law during this period, okay? But there was already a gradual openness to ecumenism as far as the Catholic Church is concerned. From the period of awakening and prophesying in 1976, that was already the period of the martial law until 1986, we see that you know, the ecclesiologies of Vatican II already found its own expression through BACs, et cetera, and all that, okay? And we see the influence of liberation theology, you know, finding uh, their own expressions in the Philippine soil. So the shift to liberationist thinking in the church became prominent, okay? And you see that, uh, that even the bishops actually produced statements like communal action toward human liberation beyond poverty into liberation, uh, people's participation away to total liberation. And the ecumenical initiatives took on a liberationist perspective. That is the reason why during this period, you could see the church getting involved uh, with different groups of that nature. Example of this, for example, especially in the 70s to 80s, Ecumenical Seminarians Fellowship organized the National Ecumenical Union sem Seminarians, promotion of church people rights, and et cetera, okay? Uh, and then the Forum for Church Response, promotion of churches, et cetera. All of this 
became very, very prominent during this period. But, <clears throat> but after the EDSA revolution, there were also some kind of a, a shift or a change. Okay, we have new arrangement, political arrangement. And so because of the EDSA uh, power, uh, people power, okay, uh, there was, which was participated in by so many different churches, okay. Peso of 1991 was also, in a way, uh, convened uh, in the Catholic Church, and it actually brought about a lot of renewal, making sure that this, the, the reflections of Vatican II would be able to be uh, really uh, accepted and really found in the very structures, systems in the life and mission of the church. So there, were, there was a call for uh, renewal for integral evangelization, new fervor and new methodology and calling for the transformation of society, okay? So very few, although there was an observation that in the PCP too, there were very few citations on ecumenism. But nevertheless, uh, Father uh, Pedro de Chutegui, who actually made uh, um, an investigation of the documents of uh, PCP2, he made, he made some claims that uh, there were very significant statements coming also from PCP2 on ecumenism. And he claims that uh, in spite of the very little attention given to it, uh, there were already very clear defined transformation that happened in the mind of the church as far as its, its relation uh, with uh, the brothers of different faith traditions are concerned. Okay, aside from this, the papal visit of 1995 firmed up the church's renewals, renewed spirit. And I would like to add that in the period of practical ecumenical engagement, uh, the period of the 90s up to our present time, we can see that there is a period of practical ecumenical engagements, you know, desire to be able to get to understand each other. And there were several different, different groups that organized themselves regionally or uh, by cities, et cetera, and I see them here, okay? It, after this, we see also that the Roman Catholic Church uh, actually participated in many different attempts, like for example, uh, to be able to highlight the importance of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Uh, for example, the year in preparation for the 500 years, I would actually assign uh, one year uh, to be able to celebrate ecumenism and interreligious dialogue along with indigenous peoples. There was uh, uh, if, if efforts that came up in terms of mutual acceptance and forgiveness between the RC and IFI, you know, facilitated by a special group organized by NCCP and also by, uh, by uh, ECHEA, okay? And dito si Maximo Obispo, saka na dito yung CBCP uh, representative na si Monsignor Bernardo. Okay. The, the whole direction in the, in the Philippines, as far as ecumenism is concerned, uh, adopts uh, the Emmaus church model, which includes the following. Uh, it calls us to walk together, which means let's build relationship with one another. It, it calls for us praying together, living in communion. And it also asks us to work together to reach out to those in need. Examples of walking together is so the ground for ecumenism, the diocesan and the parish levels, build ecumenical communities, uh, engage in dialogue and discover common beliefs, values, and practices. It is very important to note that uh, Paul, Paul Francis claims that our own ecumenical engagement basically should be able to see ourselves along the road. We have to be able to walk together. And dialogue happens as we walk together. It's not, he claims, a laboratory. It does not happen in a laboratory, but it happens within the context of our own journey together in life. And with that, we need also to be able to pray. Okay, it's medical prayer meetings and Bible service, faith sharing and life testimonies and share discernment on social conditions. Praying together, collaboration, and concrete projects like medical dental missions, consolidation, integ integration of groups, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of programs. We are doing this uh, in our own uh, ecumenical fellowship group. And I'm sure this is also being done in the other different groups uh, 
who have constituted themselves as ecumenical fellowship group. Uh, in the uh, primer ecumenism that was published by Robert and by the Echea and uh, Ati Jane, uh, they came up with uh, a description of these different groups and all of them are actually following this uh, you know, Emmaus uh, church model actually, which was proposed by Nicholas I. Iris Jesson toward an ecumenical ecclesiology. Okay, walking together, praying together, and working together. Thank you very much. I just want to end there. Sorry, I extended a bit. Um, input. Um, Okay na po. Okay na. Okay na. Closing words. <laughs> Thank okay you po, Dean, for yeah. that, ano po, uh, aha moment sa ating, uh, the journey of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, towards Vatican II, na pag-embrace pag ng uh, ecumenism. So, uh, Dahil tapos na po ang ating third speaker, uh, let's give uh, Dean Roland a uh, reaction at uh, clap or uh, the, the love uh, button siguro. Yes, uh, maraming salamat. Uh, now, we will actually be uh, giving the floor to... I will, I will now read the questions that were raised uh, earlier, uh, especially for our... Uh, two speakers uh, who spoke uh, at the early part of the program this afternoon. First po, uh, this questions to kasi siya, are for Bishop uh, Porlaris. Number one po ay uh, what was and or what did NCCP experience during the martial law period? Uh Yun po, ano pong nangyari sa NCCP uh, during the martial law period? Uh, personally, I was still a, a, a small boy at that time. Hindi ko po masyadong ano. Pero what I have heard is uh, uh, before the martial law, ang, uh, ang NCCP was a, uh, a, a place for, for uh, discussions ng mga naghahanap ng tamang direksyon na kung ano magiging uh, uh, lugar ng simbahan sa mga usapin sa lipunan. Yan yun ang kanyang ano, uh, yan ang kanyang naging uh, role ng NCCP. And it earned the ire of the dispensation at that time. Kaya sa mga naririnig ko eh, naging under surveillance ang NCCP, actually ang building because of that. Uh, alam natin na ang NCCP hindi naman na uh, uh, umuposisyon doon sa mga usapin noon. Pero because na siya ay uh, nag espouse ng, ng pagandang pagpapakilala ng tama at uh, nagbibigay ng tamang direksyon sa mga maya, eh, 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 naging ano siya, naging, naging uh, object of suspicion. suspicion. So, I believe that is to say the least. Yan po yung aking sagot yan. Salamat po, uh, Bishop Joel. Uh, we just read from our, our internal discussions here ng ating mga program uh, in charge. Noong 1973 pala ay hinuli si Bishop Laverne kasama ang NCCP staff po. Uh, this was at the first or second second year ata ng uh, ng martial law. So isang follow-up question po para kay Bishop Joel uh, uh, or anyone who can actually share about this. Ano po ang ano, contribution ng ecumenical, ng youth sa ecumenical movement? Ano po yung mga yung naging contribution ng mga kabataan sa pagpapalago ng ecumenical movement, especially in the context of NCCP po? Ay, malaking bagay. Ako isa sa mga produkto noon, sa totoo lang. Uh, ako ay, eh, para my personal experience, malaking bagay ang NCCP doon sa development ng aking uh, 
churchmanship. At the same time, ang kabataan ay malaking, malaking influensya yung kanyang movement inside and outside of the church sa mga naging programa ng ano ng uh, NCCP. At ito rin ang nagpunsod ng pagsuporta sa anang NCCP na maika nga we should cross boundary that it will not only be within the NCCP brethren but even those outside of NCCP na ma- ma- yung sinasabi ko kanina to embrace the unimbraceable to love the unlovable. Yun po yung nakita ko na uh, naging karanasan ng NCCP na ang kabataan nasa forefront ng ganoon. Kaya uh, malaking bagay po yung, ano, yung, yung interaction na yun between the NCCP, its leadership, and the youth. And for me, ako rin sa panahon na yan, eh, bilang isang seminarista, malaking pakinabang sa aming formation ang mga kabataan. At ganun din ang naging kontribusyon ng NCCP. Yun po yung aking masasagot kasi personal to itong nakita ko eh. Sige po. Salamat po Bishop. Uh, yes. Uh, as I recall sa maraming ano, usapan siguro University of the Philippines is actually one of the ano, uh, <laughs> parang ecumenical yun nga siguro uh, places of ecumenism ng mga kabataan actually doon nag-meet siguro yung mga SCMP noon yung mga 3KP noon yung mga uh, in the grounds of UP Tas, doon din at, in fact nga sa IFI ang na-found ang aming youth of the IFI sa loob talaga ng UP so yun din yung ano yung, yung yeah, na-pressure siguro yung iba kasi meron ng mga organizations ng ibang churches so medyo nag-organize uh, in the national level yun po yung parang ano ko na, I still remember in our uh, now we proceed with another question for Doc Aldrin uh, this is actually one from one of our uh Uh, participants here in Zoom. Uh, marami siyang p- na point out na mga uh, parang clauses uh, regarding ecumenism in the context of PCEC. Pero ang pinakamit talaga ng kanyang question is uh, what is the common ground of ecumenism especially in BCEC. We know that you are composed of many different various and but mataw- matawag na varied talaga na groups under PCEC. Para sa, it, sa inyo daw, ano daw yung area of unity, especially in nation building? Yun po. Thank you, Klein. Um, at sa uh, nagtanong, si, I think that's uh, from Paul Mark, ano? And um, sa akin, I think uh, yung ating concern for uh, our, uh, for the human person, in society not as an, only as an individual but uh, in terms of the collective you know dahil yung sinasabi nga natin na uh, image of god is uh, not an individual you know hindi lang siya individualistic but uh, it is a collective it refers to our relationship with each other in society you know so sa nakikita ko engagements ng PCEC um, which many many of those engagements ay kasama po ako by praise god po no Um, ang nakikita ko yun pong concern natin sa bawat isa, hostisya, righteousness, katarungan, mga ganyan pong, ang ganyan pong mga values and virtues na dapat nating mailapat. Hindi lamang po sa abstract uh, thinking but rather into concrete actions at sana po no, yun yung ating mapas on sa ating constituents. Ay, um, isa po yun sa tingin ko that's a very concrete common ground yung ating pakikipagkapwa. Ano po bang ibig sabihin yan in the context of our faith in uh, in God? Ano? So uh, yun po ang aking brief answer doon. So before we proceed with that uh, question on something that we we'll do about election, can we uh, entertain this another question for uh, Dean Roland? Uh, masasabi ba natin na si Cardinal Sin ang nagbasi club talaga ng ecumenism uh, sa Philippines o so sa Pilipinas? Uh, <coughs> Well, I I am 
not so familiar yet with, uh, I, I have to honestly say that I have not really uh, investigated that area. Uh, but I think uh, uh, if ever uh, Cardinal Sin was somehow uh, uh, in a way involved in this, it was more or less because uh, he was uh, uh, the Archbishop of Manila during that difficult time in our history. And part of his own engagement in society was to really make sure uh, that Christian faith finds its own expression and become a challenge to uh, the standing order. And I think, uh, I have, I'm not really very sure uh, whether Cardinal Sin himself took initiative to be able to connect with the different networks, uh, ecumenical networks. Uh, but I, I know that Cardinal Sin has been responsible in organizing national organizations. Okay, especially, uh, for example, pagka natapos ka na, like Sandigan Foundation of the Philippines was organized by Cardinal Sin to be, well, to be able to make sure that those who were already involved in the ministry of the church and are graduating because of their national leadership after assuming that, he would gather them together and make sure that they would continue to contribute in the development of society in that sense. Uh, but I'm so sorry that I could not uh, really give you an exact answer whether he himself was very involved in ecumenism. No problem. If somebody else here, I could do that. I didn't, I didn't see this biography, uh, yet. and I was young when he actually. Uh, yeah. Thank you, for Dean. Uh, we can proceed with this one question that would actually uh, hit all of you. <laughs> so, in what particular areas of Philippine society can the Philippine Ecumenical Trio, ang tawag niya? Uh, RC, UNCCP, or RC, can we call it CBCP, NCCP, and BCEC have a focused impact after the May 22 elections? In other words, where do you see the three organizations working together post Duterte time? Yeah. If I may respond to that, uh, I think what the country needs most is precisely moral uh, renewal okay, in, in our values. And I think uh, this has already been appreciated uh, that the role of different religions actually uh, may be able to contribute in the moral recovery of our people. Especially now that we have seen, sometimes you ask your question, your, the question, ano ba talaga? ang values ng mga Pilipino. Bakit pumapayag sila na suportahan pa rin? Ang laki pa rin ang popular support kay Duterte even if they know that Duterte, you know, by all, of course, I don't want to be moralist here. Uh, but there are so many things that he has done that more or less would disqualify him okay, uh, to meeting certain moral standards in our country. Killing people, you know, I mean, well, that still has allegedly killing some people. Or, you know, uh, problems with the relationship with women, okay? Binabastos yung mga kababaihan. Pagkatapos trying to destabilize the democratic institutions, corruption. All of these are actually uh, part of our responsibility in the church. That we need to really be able uh, to work together and uh, to be able to, if we don't uh, look too much to ourselves, we look to our people and contribute in what should be necessary in building this nation, especially the moral fibers of this country. So that's how, how we would like to look at it. That was really nice of a point, Bo, Dean uh, Roland, coming from a moral theologian, of course. Thank you so much, Bo. Uh, so, so that, Bo, uh, sino pong... Uh... Oh, pwedeng ako, ano? Uh, Sir, Bo, Bishop. Ako, uh, ano eh? We cannot talk about post Duterte administration or scenario without us involving in voters' education. Yes. And ferret, ferreting out the truth. O paano, halimbawa, kung eh, same old things that will happen. So we cannot talk about, I mean, we cannot yes. talk about post things that, uh, eh, i-post mo na lang yan sa pader, kung ganun. Diba? So sa akin ang paniniwala ko, it must not happen sa post things that will happen after Duterte. We should do it now, I believe. 
we should make it happen na ang katotohanan ay lalabas, ang tama ay may papamansag, ang balota ay gawin sagrado sa paningin at sa pananampalataya natin. Nakikita natin ito yung sagradong pagpili ng ating mamamayan sa kanyang leader. Yan ang paniniwala natin dapat natanggapin. At ako consistent ako doon sa sinasabi natin sa NCCP. We should guard our votes. We should not let people buy it for, for them to have it. Uh, na maging ano yan, uh, sa laulain, ika nga kung sa wikang Tagalog. Yan po yung aking unang pagtingin. Sapagkat kapatapos niyan, makikita natin ang tamang resulta niya pagkatapos ng eleksyon. At doon, makikita natin yung binabanggit natin lagi na uh, suportahan kung sino ang dapat na namumuhin. Yun po yung aking panigay. Sige po. Salamat, Bishop. Uh, susundan ko na po. No? Um, sa akin naman ay um, dahil napakaganda na po no? nung sina sinabi ni na Father Quazon at Bishop Joel yung, la yung lalo na sa parang napakalaki ng ating i-recover ano po at uh, gagawin. At uh, isa po doon ay yung um, tingin ko yung how do we envision a unified nation dahil yan sa after EDSA ang akala po natin noon ay uh, meron na tayong unified front regarding uh, demo, uh, tyranny against tyranny tapos pro democracy tayo pag tingin na pagdating po natin nandito tayo sa punto na mukhang we've come full circle and what happened ano at uh, as a people of god paano po kaya at alam niyo po Pagdating sa bakunan, dami nating um, nagkakawatak-watak ang body of Christ sa EJK, ganun din po. Kaya po talaga pong palaisipan din sa akin bilang isang uh, Kristiyano na tayo po yung may mga paniniwala na they're supposed to foster unity and uh, you know, talagang uh, matindi nating uh, pagkakaisa bilang Kristiyano. Pero nakapagtaka na sa mga kuntitig na natin ay uh, mga issues na, well, they're central like EJK. Yan. Pero nap, napakabilis din natin magkawatak-watak bilang uh, magkakasama sa iglesia. Ano po, ano? Even in our own uh, uh, groups, eh, ganun din po. Kaya yun po ang aking uh, para, napakalaking palaisipan. How do we move forward and uh, foster a just unity sa ating bansa? Thank you po sa sagot ng tatlo nating speaker na napaka uh, puno ng uh, insights po at ideas at saka inspiration for all of us. Uh, meron pa po bang question from our uh, participants here sa Zoom? Bigyan po, tayo, bigyan po natin ng isang ano. Isa pang question, kung meron pang question. You can just unmute yourself and just shoot the question. Ito nga po. po. Um, Papakinan na lang po. Ah, yes po. Ah, itatanong ko lang po sana. So ano po ang magiging papel ng ating mga, ng NCCP in general dun sa edukasyon especially ngayon sa ngayong election kasi nakikita po natin na nagkakaroon tayo sinasabing uh, historical revision, nagkakaroon ng uh, toxicity pagating sa kumpanya, pangangampanya ng ating mga uh, aspirants. So paano po natin i-educate bilang simbahan sa kabuuan ang ating mga kabataan dahil sa aking paningin, eh, sila nga po ang kinabukasan ng ating bayan and more so na ating church. So thank you po. Ah, uh, I think nasagot na din ni Jensek kanina. Ah, uh, yung yung sagot uh, yung ano na uh, regarding sa NCCP kasi they have this ano uh, th we have this voters education every uh, incoming elections po. Meron talaga po siya. Um meron po talaga tayong voters education uh, kasali po siya sa input even sa ano sa ating mga oh, sa mga gatherings especially especially sa youth yun din sa part ng youth din na kasama kasi siya ng ano, youth camps o kaya ng mga youth gatherings during summer kasi na timing naman na summer summer time yung elections atin so i think we have a last question from uh, PM La Laserna 
By the way po, magandang hapon po sa, sa mga distinguished kids po natin. Father Tuazon, Pastor Joel, Dr. Adrin, magandang araw po. At uh, um, I think naging malinaw po sa akin ang lahat na kung saan po tayo dapat maging common in terms of nation building. Naging malinaw na po sa akin yun na, na saan nangyayari sa lipunan, bagamat nakakaiba po tayo ng doktrina, makakaiba po tayo ng mga aral na ating sinasampalatayanan, subalit pagdating sa ating bansa, tayo po ay iisa dahil pareho po tayong mamamayan ng bansang ito. Ngayon naman, um, paano po natin, paano po natin ito mapapalakas lalo? Kasi ganito yun eh, ang ating mga kababayan, ignorante sa kasaysayan. Ang mga kababayan natin, palpak sa political theology. Napaka-laking, nap, napaka-laking gap ang nakita natin. Minsan napapaisip po ako, ano ba ang naging pakukulang po natin? Subalit, sa 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 national ecumenism na na, na binubuo ninyo na yon ang tanong po natin ay eh, paano natin mapapalakas ang integral voters education lalo na sa kanahong ito uh, sige po uh, sige po general uh, uh, yes actually to- uh, totoo yan sa pagninilay namin kasi may mga ilang grupo akong sinasamahan sa paghahanda sa darating na eleksyon. Nagbibigay kami ng political discernment session. Uh, nagbibigay ng, nagpa-facilitate ng mga, mga uh, talk social forum uh, related sa election. Ang isa na na-realize namin, yung tama yung observation na yun, na mukhang hindi ata tayo nagtagumpay uh, in relation to our uh, majority of our faithful na mapaunawa ang social teachings of the church. Yung mga tinuturong panlipunan ng simbahan. Pati yung halimbawa, magsasalita ka lang tungkol dito, sabihin sa iyo, Father, namumuliti ka, bawal yan. Yung mga ganun, na hindi naiintindihan yung pakikilahok natin sa lipunan uh, na importante yung gawin natin bilang mga Kristiyano. Uh, sa palagay ko, uh, ito yung isang sisiryosohin namin. Uh, actually, we already have a, a project of popularizing the Catholic social tradition, actually, so that it may be able to reach out to as many pe- people in the, in the grassroots as much as possible. So, yun, may, may mga translations sa, sa local languages, at saka may mga video clips, etc. Yun po ang yeah, isang konkreto. I'm sure there are a lot of other responses and um, maybe the other uh, speakers could respond to that. Uh, share their thoughts on this. Uh, pwede ako pag ano. Uh, ako, tingin ko lang po dyan, eh, ano eh. Uh, ano yan eh. Uh, it is a lifetime task. Yes. Ito po lang po. Hindi natin magagawa yan na uh, minsanan. Kasi mayroon kang ang gamot eh. Nagkaroon naman ng fake news. Ginamot mo, nagkaroon uli ng mga troll. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so, ako ang tingin ko, mga kapatid, uh, we cannot all together make it for ano, a solution. But, ako ang hinihiling ko lang, be part of the solution. Yeah. Yan lang na nakikita ko. Kung huwag tayo ang maging sagabal, maging part of solution po tayo. Kasi walang ibang magiging ka pagbabago na mangyayari sa simbahan o sa ating lipunan kung tayo mismo ang hindi magbabago. <laughs> Yun lamang po. Apo. Sa amin naman po ay um, talaga sa po nakita din namin ay ang uh, na, na-mention ni PM, ni Paul Mark, yung uh, marami po yung ignorante sa political theology or what the scripture says about political yung uh, dimension ng ating uh, pananampalataya. Kung kaya nga po, uh, actually, uh, just last year, ay uh, nagkaroon din kami ng ecumenical group, yung Faith and Bayan, na uh, series of webinars, kasama po doon na uh, Father Tuasan, si Father Danny Pilario. Responder ko po siya dahil ang topic ko sa EJK. At uh, nandun din po, si Nabisha Pambo, nandun si na Dr. Ano. Kung bagay, it was an ecumenical, ano? And um, ang amin po nakita ay sa level po ng mga sa akademya na kung saan nagte-train tayo ng sa amin po sa mga seminarista namin 
paglabas po karamihan ay abstract, very spiritual, heavenly ang uh, nagiging produkto. So uh, we are uh, we uh, palabas na po yung book na mentioned po kanina when you introduced me Klein. There's a book na yun po yung Peyton Bayan, kung ano po yung ano noon na uh, may second ano po kami, Peyton Politics. It's an interdisciplinary group. Ang aim po namin doon ay yung mga nasa seminaries, mga nasa Bible schools, mga estudyante that will give, you know, help them understand that uh, intersection of the or social the social political dimension of uh, the gospel and the faith. So yun po. Thank you. Maraming salamat po sa ating mga speakers. Uh, I think, yes, we we really want to have more time with all of you. <laughs> Pero we have come to, of course, to the end of our uh, event this afternoon. It was really uh, inspiring and insightful to hear from all of you from different perspectives, from different organizations, of course. Uh, from NCCP, from PCEC, and for of course from the Roman Catholic Church. So, ano po? Uh, uh, thank you so much, then, sa mga participants natin. Uh, to end talaga, <laughs> to end talaga this ano? Uh, our our secretariat actually requested to give to, for us for our speakers to give their ecumenical vision. Uh, a sentence or two would do for for the Philippines and for for our churches and our for our uh, ecumenical organizations. Ano po ang inyong mga ecumenical visions? Siguro gone are the days na kanya kanya tayong lakbay. I think this concept of synodality, sama sama tayong maglalakbay at patuloy na damahin ang pulso ng bayan at tumugon sa mga pangangailangan upang totoong maging buhay ang pananampalataya sa konteksto ng ating ginagalawang lipunan. Salamat po. Thank you, Dean. Can we hear from the other speakers? Uh, ako, mga kapatid, ang tingin ko, let us serve our people. There is no ideology there is no sa uh, ide ano there is no doctrinal boundaries on all of these things basta mag silbi tayo yan ang pagkakaisa hapon natin nilaman po uh, sa akin naman po na why um, patuloy po tayo magkasama-sama doon nga po sa tinatawag nating uh, national transformation moral transformation ng ating bansa sapagkat we only have one country, the Philippines, at uh, nakilala po tayo na very archipelagic, hindi lamang physically, but uh, relationally. Kung kaya po nawa ay dumating yung panahon, nawa, mapabilis, hindi po ba, no? na we will experience it in our lifetime, that we will see uh, a greater unity among, not only our, among our faiths, faith traditions, but uh, among our people na magkakaiba with IPs, you know, Bangsamoro and different. You know, because uh, ito po ang kailangan ng ating bansa so that we can move forward truly. Salamat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on my part naman, napakaganda ng experience na ito na moderating this uh, webinar. This afternoon, because uh, I am an IFI, of course, uh, I, I'm baptized IFI. I work in the seminary of the CP. <laughs> I growing up, I worship uh, in many churches. Yung minang ko dinadala ako sa Christian Fellowship Church. Yung uncle ko dinadala ako sa Grace Gospel. So yun yung lola ko lagi nagagalit kasi di ba yung 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 ano isip naman na baka madala ka doon. Uh, I just love the 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 worship experience back then and then when i was in high school i was in don bosco so bosconian today is feast day of don bosco so happy fie happy fiesta <laughs> sa mga bosconian <laughs> sa mga salishan all over <laughs> yun so my life is really ecumenism and now uh looking and hearing your stories it's really lovely and insightful to be in this forum and moderating this uh, it's really something that is close to
to to the heart of mine. So thank you so much, our speakers, uh, Bishop Joel, uh, Dr. Aldrin, of course, and Dean Roland. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, si Dr. Aldrin para ay isang Bosconian. <laughs> business, business sa atin pala, mga Bosconian. So yun, uh, ano po, uh, Uh, salamat. At uh, at this point, we call on uh, Professor Revelation Viluntak ng uh, Union Theological Seminary in Cavite, dito sa Philippines, uh, for his closing words. Can you hear me okay? Okay, volume natin. Yes, okay. Po. Okay. Okay. Po, sir. Today is the 14th year that uh, Father Carlos Abisamis has left us, so let us remember him. Today's inputs from Bishop Joel Polares, Reverend Dr. Aldrin Peñamora, and Reverend Dr. Orlando Tuazo, and our shared commemoration of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. Prior to this afternoon's event, We have heard Reverend Dr. Daniel Pilario, Reverend Dr. Terry Revolido, Reverend Dr. Ben Ngayaan, and Reverend Dr. Ferdinand Ano. Today's inputs reminded us of the genesis of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches, Vatican II, and the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, all in the 1960s, 1963, 1965, 1962, and 1968, respectively. More importantly, today's inputs reminded us of our forebears' burning quest for unity, inspired us with the stories of unwavering ecumenical commitment to life in all its fullness, and invite us to draw from the diverse articulations, expressions, and ministries of faith seeking liberation in our country from women, from young people, from the LGBTQIA plus communities, from basic sectors of our society, and from marginalized peoples, those closest to God's heart. Stories that we all need to hear and celebrate. These sessions have richly blessed us. We have been individually and collectively challenged, and we are thankful. So what do we do now? If there is a thread that binds all the worship services, conferences, meetings, consultations, mobilizations, and organizing that we have held to commemorate 500 years of Christianity in our country, I believe It is our commitment to justice. Thus, when we need to choose between equality and justice, we must choose justice. When we need to choose between unity and justice, we must choose justice. When we need to choose between the good and another good, we must choose justly. Many people, especially those whose only hope is God, those who struggle with joblessness, landlessness, and hopelessness every single day of their lives, the dispossessed, the displaced, the disenfranchised, the discriminated, and the most dehumanized, they will never ever understand what equality, what unity, and what love means until they experience justice. From the moment we wake up in the morning, to our labors of accompaniment and solidarity in our shared journeys, until we lie to rest at night, in life, in death, in life beyond death, we must choose justice like Jesus did. Choose justice, always justice. Sa iisang hapag, ating itatag ang pagkakaisa. Ang 
Sid lang basag Ating ilapag Sa dulang ng ama Pagsaluhan natin ang luksa At damhin ang sugat ng bansa At doon, doon natin ipunla Butil na diwang mapagpalaya Sa iisang hapag Ating itatag, ibangon, itindig Sa dulang ng katotohanan Sa sahig ng katarungan Doon, doon natin ipagdiwan Kapayapa at pag Ating itatag ang pagkakaisa Ang sisidlang basag Ating ilapag sa dulang ng Ama Pagsaluhan natin ang luksa At damhin ang sugat ng bansa doon, doon natin ipunla Butil na diwang mapagpalaya Sa iisang hapag Ating itatag, ibangon, itindig Sa dulang ng katotohanan sa sahig ng katarungan Doon, doon natin ipagdiwan Kapayapa at pag-ibig